Hello, hello, Max here, and we're approaching the end of the year. A time for friends, family, and spending all of your hard-earned money on pointless crap. Because if you don't, you'll be labelled a joyless bastard. We can look forward to Black Friday, which is no longer just a day Americans use to reduce their population, but a global four-week affair with bargain prices that you absolutely must check every day. Otherwise, you might miss out on a half-priced toaster. I suppose they couldn't call it Black Month. People would confuse it with Black History Month, and it wouldn't be long before we'd have some soulless travel company using Rosa Parks' face to sell us half-price holiday bus tickets. Okay, maybe that's a bit far. No travel company would ever sell half-price tickets over Christmas. It's around this time of year that your average gaming YouTuber needs to start thinking about their Game of the Year video. An important tradition that exists so the internet can make sure its opinions line up exactly with the personal feelings of the content creator. And, if they don't, make sure that a verbal lynching takes place in the comments. Being fortunate enough to be in the closed beta from day one, I've spent all this year playing Overwatch with a little bit of World of Warcraft. Now I'm sure some of you are screaming, no problem, Overwatch is easily the best game of 2016 anyway, so job done. Well, I don't think I can really do that, being that I've missed out on most of the big experiences that 2016 has offered. Whether Overwatch is the best or not, I have nothing to compare it to. Something I will be firmly catching up on once the bank balance allows. Next year I'm hoping to branch out into other games so I might be able to talk about my favourites of 2017 when we get there. What I've decided to do is put together five of my favourite moments in video game history that have really stood out to me. This way you guys get one of those nice list of things that you all seem to like so much and possibly a dose of nostalgia, because nothing could possibly ever be as good as it has been. I mean, why do we even bother trying to progress? I've been playing video games for almost 30 years. Yes, I'm apparently old because I was born in 1983. In the mid-80s, my dad bought us a Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Look at it! This god of home entertainment packed a massive 8-bit 3.5 MHz processor and 48 kilobytes of RAM. Okay, it wasn't the best money could buy because by 1986 the Nintendo Entertainment System was available in Europe and everyone's favourite red and blue plumber was forcing himself on Goombas because he couldn't remember which castle he'd left the princess in. But we had the Sinclair ZX Spectrum and after waiting half an hour for a game to load, my earliest gaming memory is of a bizarre puzzle platformer called I, Ball 2, released in 1987. The player took on the role of Ball, an unsurprisingly round fellow that shot weird squid bullet things and must progress through the levels by finding the key and then proceeding to the exit. The different blocks in the game would react in different ways when Ball came into contact with them and there was even power-ups to collect. The most ridiculous being Easy Way Out that turned every block on the level into an exit, so all you needed was the key. Looking back at the game now, nothing past level 13 looks familiar to me, so I think four-year-old me might have benefited from some helpful YouTube tips and strategy content. Shame it was four years before the first published webpage. We would eventually buy a Sega Master System and then a Mega Drive, or Genesis to you lot in America, but this isn't meant to be my history of gaming. While Eyeball 2 is an interesting and unusual first experience, everything else is fairly unremarkable. Sonic, Mario, Zelda, Golden Axe, Street Fighter, Mortal Kombat, Doom, Duke Nukem 3D, Dune 2, Command & Conquer. I guess I could throw something interesting out there like EA's lesser known Road Rash series that started in 1991. An awesome game of motorbike racing and violence where competitors could beat other racers off their bikes with fists or weapons they could steal from other riders. But I'm more interested in individual moments in games and not necessarily a game as a whole. Just a few minutes or even seconds of any game that easily comes to mind at the thought of favourite gaming moments. Maybe one of yours might be the no Russian level in Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, because of its sheer brutality and the emotional response it pulled out of you. It's personally not on my list, although I appear to have accidentally given it an honourable mention. It's not on my list because all I remember of it is the insane controversy surrounding it and nothing of what I felt and experienced when I played it through, so it has little meaning to me anymore. Which is a shame, because it was a powerful piece of immersive storytelling. What is on my list though is the intro sequence to LucasArts 1995 point and click adventure Full Throttle. Slated at the time for being too short, because quite frankly it was, Full Throttle gave us yet another beautifully written story with the usual level of humour we'd come to expect from Tim Schafer, although his reputation has become a little tainted in recent years. Full Throttle is unlikely to appear in my favourite games of all time unless we're talking top 50 or maybe even top 100, because there are other point and clicks that I enjoyed more. But Full Throttle has something that no other point and click adventure had before it or has had since. A soundtrack that blew my mind. 
it's the first time I remember really noticing the music in a video game. Sure, you can argue that the music from Mario, Zelda, and Sonic are more iconic, but I don't remember paying attention to the music at the time. Something that is often considered a positive in gaming as it usually means they've achieved a good level of immersion. And I don't think it's a bad thing either. These compositions were fantastic. Sonic 2 Chemical Plant Zone is a personal favourite of mine, but I never wanted to go out and buy the Sonic 2 soundtrack after playing the game once. Although I do now have a 10 minute loop of Chemical Plant Zone that I use for break screens when I'm streaming. Full Throttle's music fit the setting perfectly and it didn't mess about. This game had me hooked from the opening credits. Okay, it could be that I was a pre-teen about to hit puberty and the driving rock anthem appealed to my incoming teenage rebellious side, but I think it was more than that. This was one of the earliest games I remember having a truly cinematic intro. Game intros before this felt more like animated comic book pains and this was something new. By today's standards the animation is pretty janky but the art style is still fantastic and it did a good job of pulling you into the story, perfectly setting the scene. Fun fact, the cherub that smashed on the front of the limo is actually an effigy of Tim Schafer, put in the game without Tim's knowledge. This is the first time I wanted to own the soundtrack to a game. The band were called The Gone Jackals and most of the album Bone to Pick is featured in Full Throttle. The track from the intro is called Legacy. Also, I think there is a remastered due for release sometime in 2017, so keep an eye out for it if you've not played this through or if you want a little trip of nostalgia. Next we're going to take a trip over to Azeroth. I am sure World of Warcraft holds hundreds of fond memories for a lot of you as it does me, but when I first started playing it in February 2005 I had no idea I would still be struggling to put it down almost 12 years later. It was the first MMO I really played and one of the earliest moments in the game that I still think of from time to time is the first time I took a griffin ride. After thousands of hours sunk into WoW a flight path really is just a chore, chance to AFK for a minute and get a drink and a biscuit. But when I was new to the game it was something truly special. The first character I created was a human mage called Geldof, because 21 year old me was obviously hilarious, so the first griffin ride I took was from Stormwind to Sentinel Hill in Westfall. Nowadays WoW is criticised for its poorer graphics compared to other modern MMOs, but it is an upgraded 12 year old engine. Of course when you go for a more stylized look you can get away with a lot more, but back in 2005 World of Warcraft was stunning. Watching this beautiful world zip by from above the trees of Elwyn Forest was magnificent and exhilarating. I could even see other players as they duelled in Goldshire or went about their woodland questing. But it was more than just the spectacle of it, this was the moment I realised the enormous scale of the world I was playing in and my immersion went off the scale. Despite the speed the ground was zipping by beneath me it still took a minute or two to reach my destination of the next zone over. Looking at the world map this meant the continent I was on was huge and there was another bloody continent. To me at the time it was incredible, I was sucked in and I don't think I ever really left. Now from Azeroth to Black Mesa, Half-Life released in 1998 is the story of what happens when science takes things too far. Widely considered one of the greatest games of all time I'm once again interested in the intro. At the time it was groundbreaking and using intros makes getting footage for this video a lot easier. Before Half-Life storytelling in video games was done through cutscenes and NPC dialogue and apart from the occasional dialogue choices it wasn't very interactive. Half-Life introduced scripted sequences, paving the way for games like Call of Duty and Battlefield who have been accused of using this technique far too often. But in 1998 this was the first time anyone had seen it and the start of Half-Life was an experience I will never forget. The first five minutes of the bloody thing had you confined to a monorail car while the credits rolled past and Black Mesa's PA system boomed the day's announcements. The mundanity of it was bold, we were used to being thrown directly into the action in other shooters of the time. They even had the audacity to have loading screens as you progressed deeper and deeper into the facility. Can you imagine loading screens in an FPS without shooting anything? But it worked. Of course it helped that the graphics were phenomenal at the time. 
This was Valve's first game and they used their own Gold Source engine, which was a heavily modified version of the Quake engine that powered ID's 1996 Quake. Even playing through it now with its low res textures and incredibly basic lighting, I still feel a part of this world and I want to explore it. It's the perfect combination of visual and audio that really pulls you in. Even stood there in a tiny monorail car, incredibly limited by what you can do, it is still an enjoyable experience. If I ever dive into the world of VR and it doesn't make me motion sick, this is something high on my list to play. And this is only the first five minutes. When you arrive at your destination, the scripted events properly start, and you can save your game and put the cheats in. Although no matter how much you hate G-Man, you just cannot kill him. While I'm sure you may have some negative things to say about Valve when it comes to Steam, it's hard to come up with too much criticism when it comes to the games they develop. The final moment I have is from a game that no one really expected. A little bit of bonus content on an already well-hyped release that brought us Team Fortress 2 and two new episodes of the Half-Life 2 story. I'm of course talking about the Orange Box released in 2007 and Portal. If for some crazy reason you've not played Portal, please go away now and play it before you watch the rest of this video. It will ruin it for you. The concept for this game was developed by a group of senior students attending DigiPen Institute of Technology. When it was presented to Gabe Newell, Valve's managing director, he offered all the students jobs immediately and Portal was the result. Arguably the greatest puzzle game of all time, Portal also told a compelling story using an unusually minimalist approach. Some information came from the totally and completely trustworthy GLaDOS, the Aperture Science computer who guides you through the maze of puzzles. The rest came from graffiti that spawned a thousand memes. The incredible moment comes when GLaDOS runs out of tests for you to complete, so all that's left is for you to be incinerated. A big part of what gave this moment so much impact was the way this game was sold. It really was an unexpected bonus. I, like most people, had bought the orange box for Team Fortress 2 and was looking forward to the Half-Life 2 episodes, but I'd just spent a couple of hours solving interesting physics puzzles and enjoying the dark humour. This could have quite happily been the end of a fun little experience and really would have fit with the dark humour we'd experienced so far. Everything up until this point had been a clean and clinical testing environment and this area was different. The only thing we knew for sure now was the cake is a lie, and something about the lack of trust we had in our synthetic voiced overlord hinted that this might not be the end, or even if it was we shouldn't just lay down and die. Looking at it now it's not exactly a complex puzzle, but my memory of this moment is of pure exhilaration. Happy that we had solved another puzzle, excited that we hadn't died, and thrilled that the game wasn't over yet. This was the moment that a fun little experience turned into one of the greatest games of all time. Thanks for watching, if you enjoyed the video please remember to hit that like button as it helps me out a lot and subscribe for more gaming content. Let me know in the comments some of your favourite gaming moments and maybe we can look at some more in the future. You can follow me on Twitter at TotallyFutile and I stream on twitch.tv slash CynicalNerds. Our Patreon campaign can be found on patreon.com slash CynicalNerds and until next time take it easy and I'll see you soon.